in my returning to Boston again to repeat uh, the old talk I have been giving with some fresh words, new words put in here and there. Because uh, when all is said and done, my message is a very short one and a very simple one. And the message is, this environment in which we live, this world that we crave for and run after is not our real home. There is another type of living, another type of existence which is more akin to our spiritual essence and our spiritual being where we feel much happier and more comfortable. And in order to attain that state, we have to find our own selves within ourselves. It's as short as this. But if I stop at this point, you might think you have wasted your time in coming here. So I have to keep going on. <laughs> and tell some stories and juggle some more words. The truth is that for centuries, the masters have come and told us the same thing. Go within. The truth is within your own self. Your real teacher is your own higher real self. Your real guide lives inside you. True knowledge is within you. All the answers to all your questions can be found within you. They have been saying this for centuries. We have founded religions and cults and different denominations of religions on the basis of those teachings. But we have not followed those teachings. We don't go within. If somebody says, go within, we go to listen to that person outside. But we don't go within. If we find a good book entitled, Go Within, we love to read it. But we don't go within. We do everything possible to amuse ourselves, keep ourselves busy with the pursuit of a knowledge that is lying within ourselves. Why are we so stupid about this? We are very intelligent and clever in other areas. How come when it comes to seeking self-realization, when it comes to finding the knowledge of our own self, we act so stupidly that we talk of going within and stay outside? The reason is not very difficult to find. The reason is that our consciousness, our awareness, through which the entire creation comes into being, through which we experience our own existence, through which we know there is a world around, through which we have relationships with objects and things and people around, that consciousness is operating within us through the process of flow of attention. When attention flows, from awareness, we pick up, say, yeah, there is something. I can think of that. I can think of this. I can see that. I can hear this. The flow of attention makes it possible for us to know that we exist and a world around us exists. This flow of attention is responsible for all our awareness today. Now, when we look at this flow of attention, we find it is continuously in one direction, from within, outside. We want to see something, the attention from the brain, from the head, from within our own cells, flows out and goes somewhere else. We want to think of something far away, the attention flows from within, outside. All our life, from childhood till now, we have practiced the flow of attention outside. As if there is no other way to use attention except to focus on things around us or focus on things that can be recalled from a past around us or focus upon hopes and aspirations that can be built 
in the future around us. All these activities take the attention of human consciousness outward. We never practice reversing this process and saying one day in the morning, Wow, I have been using my attention in one direction all this life. How about today withdrawing my attention instead of focusing my attention on something? We never done it. So we don't know what it means. When we try to do it, it doesn't work because nobody ever taught us. In India, we believe without a living master, one cannot attain self-realization. And one of the important reasons for that belief is that only a living master can tell us, no, what you are doing is not within. You are still outside. Reading is still outside. Looking at things outside is outside. Closing your eyes and peeping into the darkness, peering into the darkness is outside. That listening to music, meditational music with your eyes shut is outside. That thoughts are outside. That everything you are doing in consciousness is outside. Only somebody who can correct our own mind's trend of thinking can guide us on this subject. Otherwise, the words go within, the literature, the books, they can all convince us. We are doing a great job of meditation by contemplating some things, contemplating on concepts and ideas. Feel must be something inside. We forget that all our concepts and ideas are arising from the associations we have made with things and people and words outside. Therefore, we have habituated ourselves to a constant flow of attention outside and these mystics and masters come again and again and repeat the same message and those around them benefit the most because those around them when they make a mistake like this are quickly corrected and told no don't think that closing the eyes takes you inside it only darkens the vision in front of you it doesn't take you inside that darkness is not inside you if you close your eyes and feel that the darkness in front of you is inside, just lift your hands and put them on the eyes and you pass all the space which you think is inside. Obviously it was outside. By the time your hands touch your eyelids, you crossed all that vastness in the darkness that you were seeing and thinking is inside. Therefore, how do we reverse this process? People try to practice on their own or on semi-qualified teachers who have themselves not had the experience of withdrawal of attention, but use of attention on various centers in the physical body, which they believe must lead us to an inverted attention within. For example, some people say, let us focus in on our hearts, the center of the being. Let us center ourselves in trying to center they close their eyes, they are still awake. In the wakeful state, their consciousness is still operating from the head behind the eyes and they start looking down upon the head, upon the heart center, upon other chakras and centers below. The energy ganglions, the different focal points from where different energies are released and operate, we start looking at them and say, now we are withdrawing our attention inwards. We are not. Because the attention is still going out from our self. The self being behind the eyes in the wakeful state. Whether you put it down or in front or at the back or above, it's going out. It has often surprised me to see people saying, after all, it all depends upon him. So when they do like this, I also look up. Where is the him they are looking at? Because the him they look at is inside, not there. Inside where? In the heart? No, because the heart is below. You close your eyes, you know where the heart is. Inside means inside where you are experiencing yourself as a conscious being. In the wakeful state, we experience ourselves as the conscious being behind the eyes. People have said it's very easy to do meditation at the heart center. 
close your eyes it's very easy to focus in on this chakra but it's very hard to just be behind the eyes focusing on nothing because we are not accustomed to this we have got habituated to focusing away from our self even when we try meditation we try different techniques of finding out the energies energy centers and different focal points which seems to stimulate different kinds of experiences we try to take advantage of them and say we are going within but we don't go within the secret of self realization which is revealed to us by these masters the experts the adepts those who have done it themselves and have the experience is how to withdraw your attention to your own self if you withdraw attention your own self all the answers can be found to you you need nothing else whoever has done it has got the results it is so universally true that nobody has questioned this nobody has come up and said i withdrew my attention to myself and found nothing there never happened i have not come across a single person putting in this claim i have that people who said we put our attention on a dot we put our attention on a circle this happened and the rest did not happen and they have complaints about the achievements by focusing attention on different things but there has never been a complaint from withdrawing attention not focusing withdrawing attention to one's own self people say how long is this spiritual journey how far do we have to go they get startled when they hear that the spiritual journey begins and ends when we stop going not how far we go it's the going that us keeping that is keeping us away from the spiritual destination if we stop going anywhere through our thoughts and attention we are at the destination the destination is our own self the real self the self from which consciousness itself is occurring from which this existence is coming into being from where we come to know we are there and everything else is there it does not mean that the self has to be independent of us in fact the self is always in the core of our own self some people might feel that the self or the soul or the spirit whatever name you give it is located in a particular place it's not located in a particular place because if it could be located in a particular place which we could find out then we would not be the self that particular place would be the self the truth is the particular place revolves around us and the self creates that particular place in this human body we have an advantage over all other forms of life in all other forms of life we have a programmed existence our cells carry the programmed message of how to live how to respond what to do next how to use instincts how to use reason all the conditioning is already fixed and we move according to the program it's only in the human body that consciousness starts acting a little different than it does by a programmed instinctive way in every other form and that is it starts questioning and debating should i or should i not should i go right or should i go left is this worth doing or not worth doing this particular deliberative function that takes place in consciousness uniquely in human beings has sometimes been described as the exercise of free will people are using this free will and distinguishing themselves from all other living creatures all other living things are different from us because they don't use this deliberative process we call free will but when they use free will people forget that the free will they are using is a very dangerous thing people are believers in god and they say god is all knowing and all powerful and then they start saying should we do this or not do this as if god knows nothing about 
how could we be all knowing and all powerful if we have the power to decide whether we should do this or not do this if we really knew that the decision is ours to go right or left that means prior to the decision god knew nothing whether we'll go right or left supposing he knew that we will go right then we have no free will we only feel we have free will that we will after deliberation left or right left or right okay let me go right god laughs you see i knew before that he go right then he has free will and god justifies the title we give to him of being all knowing and all present all the titles we give and attributes we give to god become justified only if our free will is not real if our free will is real we take away all those attributes from god here are people caught in this dichotomy caught in the belief that god is all knowing and constantly planning i don't think i can do it i have to make up my mind i have to decide for myself we have to decide things for ourselves god has given us free will so that we can decide things for ourselves we don't realize that if god gave us that kind of free will to decide things for ourselves he disappears he does not stay in the role in which we put him that he is all knowing and knows in advance everything that is going to happen this dichotomy is resolved only if we have self realization what happens when we have self realization when we withdraw attention to the self we find that what is external to us is being created by that self it does not mean that the external experiences are existing by themselves and we are just picking them up that consciousness is just a receptor it looks like a receptor but when we withdraw attention to the self we find its power to create in the same way like the same self during sleep engages in dreaming and when it spins out a world of dream the world looks real and we meet people and they argue with us they attack us and we run away from them and we wake up to find we created all those people including the attacks upon ourselves to sustain the dream sequence if at that time somebody were to say that the dreamer which is the self the same self who's woken up that the same self was not creating the dream but was merely picking up the dream was existing independently that even if one woke up the dream would still be there then one would take the dream to be real a world to be real and take this world to be real i am suggesting for consideration that this world could be just a better more clear more consistent more three and four dimensional dream which the self is engaged in right now and has the make believe in the same pattern as in a regular lower ca- category of dreams that everything is already existing i am merely the receptor in which case if we could wake up to a super awakened level above this level of the physical wakefulness we might discover that this was a creation exactly of the same type as the one in the dream namely that consciousness acting as the self generated this entire experience around itself if that were so and we could awaken to this discovery and find another world better for us gives more happiness and find that that itself is also a dream and again wake up and keep on awakening again and again till we find there is no one else and nothing else to wake up to except the single self the single consciousness which went through all these stages of dreams what would we call that single self we'd call that self god the creator because all the rest came from there the dreaming process being the process of creation the self being the only reality and therefore every level of experience was nothing more but the experience within that self created like a dream to look like being outside there is a little snag in this and that is if you create something then you should be able to 
hold it only so long as you are experiencing it. Supposing a dream is being experienced and we are watching a flower like I am wearing a message, St. Patrick's Day, right here. I am watching this flower in a dream and the green flower, normally it's white or pink or red, today it's green and I know in the dream it's St. Patrick's Day and I look at it. If I turn my eyes away in the dream, the flower won't be there. Only when I look at the flower, it will be there. If I turn my eyes away, it won't be there. Therefore, I can visualize that the flower comes into existence or the experience of the flower comes into existence because I am directing my consciousness or my attention to it. That if I withdrew my attention, it won't be there. And this is where the catch is that people around us in this physical world say, even if you don't look at your coat lapel, the flower is still there. Therefore, it must be real. You're not creating it. And the same thing could happen in the dream too. If in the dream I began speaking to an audience and somebody said, you can't see the flower, we can see it, I'll forget they are also as much part of the dream as the flower. How can I cross-check from a creation of the same type as the rest of the dream, whether the dream is real or unreal. That's how we are confirming the reality of this material existence in this world by cross-checking with the very product of our consciousness, which is what we see, perceive, have relationship with through consciousness in the wakeful state. But one could say, if you could see a thing, if the thing is there and then you saw it, then the thing must be real, then the material world must be real. But if seeing it creates the thing, then it's not real, then the idealists are right that your consciousness creates all your experience. So the real clue would be what comes first. When you see a flower, does the flower come first or the seeing of the flower come first? If the flower comes first, the material world is real. If seeing the flower comes first, the material world is hungry. Unfortunately, for both these points of view, none of them comes first. They come at the same time. There is no way to separate them. We can have no experience of a flower except by seeing it, touching it, sensory perception of it. This perception is simultaneous, without any break in time at all. And therefore, there is no way to say which is the cause and which is the effect. There is no way to say whether this entire creation around us is an effect of consciousness or that the perception of this world around us is the cause because the real world is around us. That question has been put by philosophers, by speculators for so long, ultimately experienced people who could go into the root of this question by going back to consciousness itself, the self. They came up with answers and they said the answer is so simple, you can go in and try for yourself. They came to the conclusion that the self is not merely a receptor but a creator and the creation and reception takes place simultaneously. Therefore, if you want to understand the nature of this creation, withdraw yourself to the, to the inner core of consciousness and see if you can awaken to a different level of consciousness. They prescribe some simple exercises by which one could withdraw attention to their own focal point from where attention was going out. They did not specify, look for this spot or look for that thing. They said, look for yourself. Close your eyes. Do you feel you are there? Are you thinking from somewhere? Are you questioning from somewhere? That's where you are. Withdraw your attention there. Just be there. Don't concentrate on going anywhere. Don't concentrate on focusing anywhere. Just be there. They were actually saying a superfluous thing because you are there. But they say be there means withdraw the operation of the flow of attention. It's the attention that is going out. 
and they observed in such a simple way that our attention goes to the illusions we create through the creative process of consciousness and then we get tied up with those illusions and make them real. We use more than one source of experience. For example, we see with the eyes and touch with the hands and use one with the other to corroborate the existence of the thing. We use five senses and they all tie up to convince us that this must be real. If I saw this, it was unreal. If I put my hand through it and could move through this desk, I would say it's unreal. But when I touch it, it's hard, real. So the sense of touch is used to corroborate the existence of something that the sense of sight is convincing it is there. Though all the sense perceptions operate on the same basis. The basis being that the nervous system in the body, whether it is the optic nerve or the nerves that give us hearing or touch, the tactile nerves, when you use these nerves, they convey a message. If you take the sense of sight, it is said, if something is there, it casts an inverted image on the retina. The retina being the extension of the optic nerve. The rods and cones of the retina or the nerve take it to the brain and located in the right spot in the gray matter, we become conscious of the existence of that which we are seeing. Supposing the retina had a built-in device of creating inverted images, we would see things exactly as they are. So the rest of the process of seeing is identical. Supposing the retina did not have any inverted images, but only the brain center was able to create the same thing which we now ascribe to being created by the stimuli outside, we would see the stimuli outside and also have the, uh, the inverted image on the retina and see exactly the same. Even if we, there was no such point in the brain receiving this kind of stimuli within, but only consciousness was seated there and consciousness played this trick, we would see exactly the same. So long as consciousness in the brain is getting these messages and creating the world, if consciousness is the creator, it will create exactly in the same way as we are seeing now. There will be no difference at all. If we could see why a particular pattern is being created and switch it on and off, then we will believe this is being done by us and not from outside. There's masters and mystics who have experienced the experiment called withdrawal of attention to themselves and thereby becoming aware of their own self. They have been able to locate their attention upon themselves and thereby switch the play, the channel that is going on. If you can switch channels by going back to your own self, then you know that you are playing the channels, that there was nothing fixed. This switching of channels from one level of creation to another, from one state of or region of existence to another, from one level of consciousness to another, this switching of channels is possible if we withdraw our attention to our own self. When these masters make statements like this, when they give this message to us, they don't do it like philosophers. They don't say, we believe this is one of the possible explanations. This is our hypothesis. This is our theory. They don't say that. They say this is our experience. Looks like if you did it, it would be your experience tried out. They want you to try for yourself. If your experience is different, they'll be very happy to share it. They'll be very happy to listen to you. If you withdrew your attention, would it be different? Then what they do, when they do it, they have done it. Their only qualification is that they have done something that they have come to teach us. They need not have written any books. They need not have studied in any university. They need not be any particular height or age. 
they need not belong to any particular culture or nationality their qualification is they have done what they are asking us to do namely withdraw attention to one's own self within the head wherever you feel you are if you withdraw your attention to yourself something happens that you understand the nature of consciousness and how it is operating and if it is operating to, to create a universe how you can switch that universe at any channel you like they also say it's very simple that the channels that you can change by withdrawing attention to yourself are very similar because they are operating within the different covers which we identify as ourselves today somebody says who are you we immediately respond by giving our name and whatever we know about our body stan came here he said i am stan salad and there is ishwar puri he was actually referring to the name given to his body and the name given to my body if the self is consciousness which is using a body it was somewhat unjust to describe the self with those names but since the self is not conscious of any other form except the body so it is reasonable that in the state of ignorance we call ourselves by the names given to our body it doesn't stop here we identify the entire creation around us from this standpoint if my son comes i'll say gentlemen ladies and gentlemen i want to introduce you to my son i don't say ladies and gentlemen i want to introduce you to the son of my body which is the truth but i will so identify myself with the physical body that when i talk of self nothing will occur to me except the physical body with the result that there is no other world for me except the one created by my relationship with the physical body therefore there is no other world except the physical world once i start identifying myself with the physical only physical becomes real for me this identification is so important if we start identifying with the physical body then the physical world alone becomes real for us but supposing one were to say i have a consciousness that is using the body it's living in the body it's a vehicle this body is a vehicle it is using i want to find out what that consciousness what is this real self that is temporarily obviously temporarily because the body is so short lived temporarily resides here or is the body the only reality and this consciousness that i am trying to locate is merely a function of the body why not find out either way by withdrawing attention to that which is inside the body when one withdraws attention one starts forgetting what's happening outside that's the meaning of withdrawal of attention when you put attention you see clearly you might notice if you go listen to the music in the boston symphony or any symphony any orchestra playing with lot of musical instruments playing there and you can by putting your attention on one instrument if you want to listen to the drums more than the others it looks like drums are playing louder drums aren't really playing louder but your attention makes the drums more real than the rest similarly you may have a number of things on a wall painting and you start looking at one that one comes out in greater relief than the rest actually they are still painted the same but the attention makes that more real the power of attention to make things more or less real is so great that when we withdraw attention to our own self and make our own self more real we discover that the physical body which we were thinking is the only reality is not that real the first signs of that come when we becoming unconscious of the body gradually unconscious of the body begin to see that if our eyes can still see the body is becoming unconscious it startles us how can we see 
take the if we close our eyes and can still see it's amazing how can the eyes see when when the eyes are closed we forget at that time that in the dream also we see with our eyes closed but we say that's imagination even now we imagine something we can see but we say oh that's the mental eye some other eye that is looking at imagination it's not looking at what is happening in front really but when we withdraw attention the power to see increases the power to hear increases the power to touch taste and smell increases and we wonder how can this sensory perception which we associated with the physical body and which we thought were only acutely active when we are in the body be still active when we are not in the body that surprises us that's the first sign that we start thinking that this perception sensory perception is not based upon the physical body is based upon consciousness as we withdraw our attention more to our own selves we find that our understanding of the physical body undergoes a change that if we like we can just step aside the body is still there it's a very remarkable experience those who have done it have felt so strange about it how can you step aside and see your own body and still where you have stepped aside you are able to see everything else too then more strange things happen by this little experiment done with one's own consciousness that when one withdraws one attention the body can be separated and you can watch all those things happening and then you find you are so light you don't have to go dieting to lose your weight because you have no weight that you can see so clearly you can see through what was otherwise a barrier like walls and you can fly without wings that a person comes and is thinking something about you and you can hear the thought as if you are thinking about it this is such a strange experience to the same consciousness which is now locked in the body at one begins to realize that must be more real than this if after that you step back into this body and get into this coarse cage that is enveloping us now then we realize this body only hides the self it is not the self unless this kind of experience happens to us personally we cannot really say that consciousness is the creator of this experience therefore these masters the mystics who have come here they tell us do it yourself do what they call it dying while living they they call it dying while living because when we when the physical body dies it's exactly the same experience that happens the attention is withdrawn suddenly the body doesn't know where the hands and feet are doesn't know where the trunk is head is still conscious the person can still speak and suddenly it appears something dies from the brain as if you get separated and you can see that you are dead you must have heard of a number of near death experiences all very similar surprisingly similar but they haven't died enough to give you the details but the mystics and masters say why don't you die fully while you are alive and see what happens you will find that what you thought were perceptions through senses built into the physical system were in fact senses of perception built into the conscious system operating in the physical body that you could separate them they don't become weaker in their action weaker in their effectiveness but strong they go further they say but supposing you became light and you became telepathic and you had all those uh, strange experiences of flying in the sky so what one can have a good dream and have the same experiences where is knowledge how does this compare with realization self realization how do you find what the self is so the ma- master say don't stop there that is just to tell you that the direction is right 
you are on the right track the track being go within to your own self the journey is in the right direction that you are going from outside to within but don't stop if you stop there you are merely land- landing on another plane which is not very different from this one in terms of absolute reality you just have different experiences maybe be- better experiences you will lose your free will maybe the loss is great you will lose your ignorance you get all the knowledge therefore you will lose your free will you will know what you are going to decide tomorrow how can you decide therefore then you know past present and future you have gained something and you have lost something you have lost the bliss of ignorance the bliss of free will which only exists here but you you lose weight you lose uh, doubts you lose fear you lose many of the negative things of this world but even after all this trading it good and bad you are none the wiser so far as the true nature of the self is concerned it's merely switching from one type of experience to another how do you proceed to find out the truth they say don't stop it keep on dying while living in the next higher stage of what you think is your being yourself you will notice if you have done meditation of this sort earlier or if you will try it now tomorrow whenever if you try this you will notice that the form in which you exist weightless in which you exist without the gross matter of this body the astral form the ethereal form the light form in which you exist that form is also very similar to this form that the sensory perceptions function in that form almost located identically to the physical form in fact the physical form takes shape from that form when you find that then that is as much a cover upon the self as this one is so you haven't really moved too much towards a knowledge of your own self you have merely moved one cover deep you gone little skin deep you gone under this skin and found out that there is a reality of your own being which is different from this perhaps more real than this perhaps more awakened than this but still a cover therefore you must proceed further to withdraw your attention from those sensory perceptions from that body within consciousness that operates in that body the consciousness that receives the sense perceptions from the astral or ethereal body you should withdraw your attention to that if you do it what will happen you will lose consciousness of the senses just like in the first exercise you lost the consciousness of the physical body but the senses were as acute as ever when you withdraw your attention from the sensory body or the astral body you find that your perception becomes stronger and not weaker that's strange because we have never been able to think of perception as independent from sensory perception our understanding of consciousness has been when senses see we know it that is why we are conscious of the senses we have identified ourselves so much first with this body and then with the sensory systems that even when this body is not there we say that's me that's the soul i have found the soul this must be the soul they talk of at transmigrating and reincarnating this must be the soul that goes to heaven this must be heaven because i can fly in the sky you are nowhere in heaven just in a different dimension of consciousness just using a inner level an inner cover of the self to have a new experience therefore when the masters teach us how to withdraw attention which is the same principle withdraw attention in the sensory body to the core of yourself from where the attention is flowing out more easily how easy they make it to withdraw attention when you withdraw attention to the core of the being of the consciousness that is experiencing the sense perceptions you find that there is a mental self which perceives without use of senses that senses 
are only spinning out a perception into different categories and compartments. Just like the eyes and ears were dividing the seeing and hearing, that even in the astral body, even in the ethereal fine body, we were dividing up a particular experience into different categories just for the purpose of perception. That it was equally possible for human consciousness to see music and to hear music. That there would be no distinction in the two. That what made the distinction was our treating music as an object of sensory perception, which has to be only heard. And to see a light show or show of colors as a visual perception and therefore to be seen only to the visual perception. Supposing you combine these, if you could see music, my saying so here may not make much sense, but if you were in the state when you withdraw attention to your own self within the sensory perception, you will find that you can see music as easily, as naturally as you can hear it. The truth is music is an experience. We categorize it because we are trapped in the distinction between senses. This distinction is removed when we withdraw our attention to our own real self within the astral body and we find that we have a mental apparatus, an apparatus of an extremely clever and efficient mind that can perceive and be a substitute for all the senses we have used. Not only is the mind a good substitute for individual senses, it can combine the perception of different senses. Eventually, it can perceive things that do not belong to the senses and can open up a new world of perception, mental perception, which has nothing to do with any senses at all. And we find that to be an amazing amusement. I don't know if I'm using the right word. When one transcends these, one forgets about weight loss and flying in the sky, those look like children's games. Because when you have direct mental perception, you realize how time was created. Why were you given a particular pattern of experience here? Why were you wearing this color of dress? Why was your body short or tall? Why were you born in the physical experience at a particular time? What made you pick up a package of experiences that runs linearly, linear in a time sequence? What made you pick up this destiny? What makes destiny? People, you might have heard of a phrase called Akashic Records or Akashic Records. Heard? Those who heard, please raise your hands. Good. Akashic Records is nothing but the package of destiny which we run through because we are conscious of it there. How would you like it if you could withdraw your attention to your own self and in that mental, causal, personal perception you begin to know what your Akashic records are, how they were set up. You have immediate access to those records which means really that you begin to understand your own consciousness to the degree that you find out what happened, when, what is this cause and effect relationship, what is karma, why are we here, can we link it with past actions, when did the past actions come, did we make them, did somebody else make them, did the self create past actions, who is responsible for this. Those answers don't have to be found by speculation, but by reliving the experiences that go into those actions. Which means, if one has by an exercise which might have taken an hour or two in the physical body, gone within to that point, one can know exactly how one came through all these different births, rebirths, incarnations, different forms of life, how did it happen? This personal experience of past, present and future had a new nature of time, where you find time is something you hang all these experiences on. This is not sensory perception. This is not physical journey. 
This is a direct experience of the pattern of existence, the pattern of our life to which we gain an access just by going within our own soul. We can move forward, backward. <clears throat> we say we don't like this life. We like the life that we had in the 16th century. Relive it. In any case, you picked up a capsule. When we come and we say, this is our karma. Karma is all set in time and is made by the mind. How can we say, this is our karma and we don't want it? If we did it, then we must be responsible for it. If somebody else did it, he must be responsible. If God set it up, he should be responsible. If it's our karma, when did we do it? How could we have karma on day one? When this world was created, there could be no karma. How could we be trapped into karma when the creation took place and we pure souls, pure spirits came here? We had no karma. How did we create it? There you find the truth. In the causal region, in the causal state of consciousness, within your own mind, you find that karma is not real. It was merely a, a package, a cassette you tried to play on consciousness and opened up a world. The moment you opened up one cassette, it had its past and its future. You can go and change it. Somebody wants to change the karma and have a totally different destiny, that's the nearest point where you can do it. There is no way to change destiny sitting here. You can make very minor modifications in illusion. Think you have made it. But there it's recorded that you will make these minor modifications. So you really made no modification. But over there, you can pick up another cassette. How can you have access to that ability to change destiny? By withdrawing yourself to that inner form of the self from where this is operating. If one were to stop there, one would say, I have reached the ultimate, the universal mind, the creator of all experiences. This must be it. But these masters come and give us the message, don't stop. This is not the end. This is just another form of experience. How has your knowledge grown about your own self? The self is still caught up in a higher and different experience. You are feeling very proud that you got this experience of how things happen. But this is just an experience. It's not you. You must go ahead and know the you, the self. The Nasdaq say, follow the same procedure again. Go within your causal self. Go within your mind. Withdraw your attention inside to your mind. What will happen? If you withdraw attention to the core of consciousness, not to any particular point, but to your own self around which thoughts revolve, around which Akashic records revolve, around which all concepts revolve, around which all total perceptions revolve. If you withdraw your attention to the core of consciousness, the receptor within this causal self, what will happen? You will find that the causal self was just a cover as much as the body that the mind is as much a cover upon human consciousness as the physical body. Something which is almost impossible to accept while we are in the physical body. Unless one has had these experiences with the self, it's almost impossible to believe that the mind which thinks within us, the mind which gives us the question and answers, that that could be just a cover upon the real self, which is pure consciousness and a receptor of those questions and answers and a receptor of the mental things that happen around. But we can withdraw attention within, go within the mind to ourselves. what will happen? Same thing again, we'll become unconscious of the thoughts, unconscious of the mental games of time and space, and yet more conscious, more efficient in the use of consciousness as a self than ever before. And we'll suddenly discover that the mind was a hindrance to experience, not an aid. That experience did not require time. That true experiences which seeped through all these layers and gave us some inkling of what true experience could be, even when we were covered up to the human physical body, they still take place, such as experience of instant knowledge, 
which we called intuition in the physical system, such as the experience of love, which we couldn't understand and mix it up with attachments in the physical system, such as the experience of beauty and joy, which we had tried to ascribe to the thing that was giving that experience, little realizing that if we were mad, the beautiful thing became ugly, and we didn't realize that the source of these experiences of beauty, joy, love, intuition did not lie in the mind at all. Till we reach that stage, we cannot find out the origin of these experiences. But once we reach that stage, we find that these are the natural experiences of our own spiritual self without the mind, without the senses, without the body. And one of the most beautiful things about those experiences is they don't require time. They don't occur in time. They don't require space. They don't occur in this, this kind of framework. Even here, a thought takes time. Even the smallest thought, we can say this, I thought over it. Ah, yes. One second. Two seconds. There's a time. But when intuition comes, just this. Gut knowledge. That flash. Absolutely no time. You cannot say it takes a small nanosecond. It's not even a billionth of a nanosecond. There is no time involved. You didn't know it and then you suddenly know it. That's called intuition. That sudden gut knowledge, that sudden hunch that we get here is coming from the soul, not from the mind. The mind is incapable of that activity. The mind can think about what happened. The mind can say, how can that be? That's not real. It is not logical. Oh no, I don't like it. You can dismiss it. But still there, it happened out of the dimension of time. It also does not occur in the dimension of cause and effect that goes with time. All mental functions, reasoning, logic, perception, sensory perception, on which we base our decisions here, follow the law of cause and effect. But love, intuition, beauty and joy do not follow it. It can occur just without following any reason. In fact, they very often come against the reason, against the cause, and therefore they are causeless. They oppose the cause and effect relationship. Why? The answer to this question, why, is found there. When we withdraw our attention to the core of the mental self, we find the spirit, what we call the soul of a human being. This pure consciousness, not trammeled by these mental activities going around. And that is the source of the kind of happiness we are thinking of. So we can, for the first time, claim, now I know myself. Now I know what it meant when the master said, know yourself. First time I can say, now I know I, myself, because I can experience my consciousness without the covers of mind, senses and body. If one has achieved this through a process which is available to us now, which is a successive dying while living in each kinds of our bodies, then we can say we are self-realized, that we have realized our own self. And then we feel very happy. I found it. Till the masters come up again and say, what? You stopped your journey just because you found your soul? Of course not. Only perfect living masters who have attained the truth of the highest order can come and stop us at that time. You say, how can this stop us now? We crossed all the covers that are known, the physical system, the body, the astral system, the sensory systems, the mind, the thoughts, everything we have surrendered. And we have experienced our own pristine glory of the soul, of our own spirit. How can you tell us the journey is not over? And the masters say, how could the journey be over? If you say, I am very happy, where is this I coming from? How could I be happy? Where is that I? Is there any I in that consciousness you observe? And that's the strangest experience that you find that what you thought was the soul was also a cover. It's a cover of individualization, a cover of individualizing yourself as if there is something besides you. In order to have the experience of pure spirituality, of pure consciousness, you are saying I'm one consciousness. That's illusion too. It's as much of a cover, as much of creation, as much of illusion, 
as the rest of the covers of mind, senses and body and of the physical world around. These perfect living masters come and give us a message. No, go within the eye. Don't think you are bound by any limitation. This itself around you in a timeless sense. My intuition is not true. Intuition is true. My intuition is not true. My intuition is limiting you to an individualized status. Which look at it, go within and see if it is real. Then you go within yourself to drop the one that goes within. That's a strange thing. Because it is the individual that goes within. We never let go of the individual in all this process. That we were saying, let's go within the body and see if there's something happening in the eyes, behind the eyes, in the head. We got into meditation, still the eye going within. We said, no, these senses can operate by themselves. I want to go within the senses. Opened up a causal mental world. Ah, I can now see the universality of this creation and my own universe. No, this is mine. I go within and find that I am consciousness. How can there be greater truth? The greater truth is, I am conscious is not the highest knowledge. I is still the illusion. When you drop I, you are really dropping the one who started going within. You drop the very seeker. And where do you end up? When you drop the seeker, you find the sort. And you find there was no difference within them. That's the best surprise in the exercise these masters give us. That at the other end of totality of consciousness, where there is no I, there is only one totality of consciousness, the word one being improperly used here, that there is only one totality of consciousness which has never been separated, never broken to pieces, and has always been total, and the whole show of creation at every level has taken place within that consciousness, and that consciousness is the self at all levels. That the spot was the secret, that there was no I, is the most beautiful surprise in the spiritual journey, that we find the totality being only one. That's great! Because when you find there's only one consciousness, the rest are dreams. But dreams so beautifully spun out, they look real at every stage, more and more real. And we create this whole universe around us, a strange kind of perception of this universe comes to us. And we understand everything. And not only do we get the benefit of having an experience by denying the experience of the lower levels, we travel back and regain all these experiences without losing the experience of the totality and know what all this is about. And then the master can only come with that experience and have a strange smile and compassion. A strange kind of attitude they have, mostly filled with love and compassion for us. Because they are looking at it from the totality. Because there is no one else. It's self-created. All the beings are self-created and occur within that one. Sometimes you might have heard that this spiritual journey <clears throat> is like a drop of water separated from the ocean which goes to merge back in its source. Anybody heard that story? That the spiritual journey is the merging of an individual soul in the creator who is the totality. I also heard this when I was a child and I was very, very frustrated by this. I was very disappointed. In fact, I was very mad that if, if, if the creator is the ocean full of water and I am a drop from that ocean, separated from that ocean, and all I have to do by the spiritual journey is to go and merge in it, who is the gainer in this process? At least I am a drop today. When I merge, I am gone. I don't gain anything. And the ocean will not be much concern is one more drop getting into it or not. Neither I gain nor the ocean gains. What is all these masters talking about spiritual journey? Go and merge there. I was in this error about the nature of the spiritual journey for many years. But experience tells us, when we experience, that it is indeed the merging of a drop of the ocean in the ocean 
but it is a drop that never left the ocean. That's the secret. That we are an individualized consciousness experiencing this universe as an individualized consciousness never having left the totality. Because if we had left the totality, it wouldn't be total anymore. Therefore, the totality created a state of awareness in which it could be individualized. The totality created a state of awareness in which it could spin a mind-time-space framework around itself. The totality is so willed that it could put on senses to make it more beautiful. The totality is so ordained and willed and wished that it should be so physically created that this should look so real. And totality put its real power of willing into the lowest form of the same consciousness in a physical form. That's the human being. And that was free will. Therefore, when we say, do we have free will? The answer, answer can be no. Because if we had, then God wouldn't know what we are going to do. But then the answer, second answer is, do we have free will? The answer is yes, because in our reality, we are the same God. Therefore, the free will is of the same being. Therefore, the answer can be yes or no, depending upon our state of awareness. Then, we can also say, yes, we have free will, because we are ignorant what we are going to do. If we had knowledge, we wouldn't have free will. Therefore, our free will is real only in ignorance. The moment knowledge comes, we lose free will. And the one who has real knowledge, which is our own full self, total self, has the real free will. Free will is one of those things that bother a lot of people. Free will, the truth is, if man and God are two beings, man has free will out of ignorance and God has free will out of knowledge. The truth is that they are not two beings. If you say, can man see God? The answer is no. Because by the time he is equipped to see God, he is God. He can become God, but he can't see God. The state of consciousness will alter to totality. Therefore, either one is man or one is God. Or in between the various stages of progression to the level of consciousness. These masters and mystics come and teach us in a very simple way how we can practically proceed to determine if all that they have said can happen to us. We can proceed to withdraw our attention through simple exercises that they teach and through the love that they create and they take us back to the core of consciousness where the totality is experienced personally. When that happens, all the answers come to us automatically. We don't have to read any books. We don't have to go to any workshops or lectures. The workshops and lectures and books are only worthwhile if they make us start out on the journey with them. If they don't, they are worthless. If they only take our attention outside, then there are a lot of things taking our attention outside. But the masters when they come, they push us back into our own selves. One teacher from India came to this country many years ago. You might have heard his name, Swami Vivekananda. What is his name? He spoke in the World Congress of Religions and he made a point saying that this whole world around us is Maya, Nitya, illusion. It is not real. He said, whatever you are seeing around you is unreal. What is real is the one that is seen, the self. He said, everything that you see here around you is unreal. And then he put a question. He says, if it is true, Whatever you are seeing and hearing is unreal. What about me? I am talking to you and you are listening to me. I must be unreal also. How come being unreal, I am trying to tell you about reality? How can an unreal being start teaching about reality? And then he answered his own question himself. He said, the truth is, I am as unreal as the rest of the world that you are watching. With one difference. The rest of the unreality pulls you towards itself and ties you up there. This unreality pushes you back into your own self and tells you where the real reality is. That's the only difference. Otherwise, both are illusions. He gave a beautiful answer. 
which means that when we look at a master, when we say there is a perfect spiritual master or teacher, a perfect Sadhguru, a real Guru, a real teacher, what we are really looking at is an external experience that brings us back to the reality within, including the reality that that external experience was not real but was created by the reality within. That is why these real masters never draw our attention to outside rituals, ceremonies, external things from which we create religions. We set up more rituals and more rules and regulations. They push us back into the reality within our own self. And they say, you want to find the real teacher? Take us only as a temporary teacher. Go within and find the real teacher. The real teacher is within you. So they keep on pressing this point. But why do they participate in talking to us, in discussing? Why do they create this pattern? I give a little example. If we were sleeping and wanted to wake up and didn't know fully that we were sleeping, but had a little strange kind of dream. Have you ever had a dream where you begin to feel it is a dream, not real? Anybody had that? Good, so you understand. In the dream, we feel it's a dream, but how do we get up? Should we go and run where we are sleeping? I remember as a child, I used to run to find where is my bedroom? Where am I sleeping? I want to go back into the body and wake up. But it wasn't real. I wasn't really running anywhere. When I woke up, I found I created that experience of running around. But while the dream lasted, even the knowledge that it's a dream is not reality, it's not wakefulness. It's real knowledge. But real knowledge is good, is not good enough, is not equivalent to wakefulness. Supposing I want to really wake up, what's the best means? The best means is if there's another person who's awake and I'm sleeping and he gives me a nudge, get up, that's real wakefulness. The real wakefulness comes when an awakened person gives a nudge on the side and says, get up. But it's possible that when he gives me a nudge, I'm having a nice dream. And I generally give an example that I might be eating a pizza which I just got from Pizza Hut. It used to be the old shakies, but they don't find too many of them. If I am saying, I am having a nice pizza from Pizza Hut, and he is nudging me, get up. In my dream, in the process of wakefulness, I am likely to mutter and to murmur and to speak up, both in the dream and some words in the body that is sleeping, let me finish my pizza. What will he say? If he is a good waker, a good awakener, he will say, don't worry, I'll hold your pizza, you wake up. I wake up very quickly after that. Then I'll say, where is my pizza? Will I ask that? I won't. Will I say, you told me a lie. You said I'll hold your pizza. You knew all the time there is no pizza. Why did you say this? He only said it in order to participate in my dream. At that point, what I needed to waken up. Therefore, these wonderful experiences we have, which we call coming across a perfect living master, whose messages I am sharing with you today, these wonderful experiences come in the process of being nudged to wakefulness. And when we find them, we find what they said here was not so relevant as the fact that they are saying made us wake up. And therefore, their mastery consists not of the words they use, not of the things they say, but the effect they have upon our consciousness and how much they can awaken us. One of the best techniques they use is the technique of love, because that comes from the soul. And those who come from that region, you will find them sharing so much of love, which we can't even understand where it comes from, because it is different. It's not the kind of attachments that we have experienced. It's something else that happens to us. Something of an identification. Something where we begin to feel we are there and they are here. Something that we feel their presence. Something that makes us feel they are present within. That kind of strange feeling of love is one of the things that happens in the company and presence of these beings, these living people whom we call perfect living masters. They are performing their role 
they are performing their function of awakening us in this beautiful way. And how do we find these beautiful people? How do we how do we locate them? Where do we find them? Where do they live? The answer is obviously we can't find them. If you could find them, then we'd be awake. How can a blind person find somebody with eyes? It's only the person with eyes who can be found. Hence the saying in India, when the chela is ready, the guru appears. They never say, when chela is ready, he can find a guru. Never heard that. When the disciple is ready, the teacher appears. How does the teacher know that the disciple is ready? If he doesn't know, he's not a good teacher. He's not the kind of teacher I'm speaking about. The teacher I'm speaking about is already inside the chela. He's already inside the disciple and appears outside because the inside is ready. How does he appear? By one of the most beautiful things that happen to human beings called a good coincidence. What is coincidence? Coincidence is nothing but certain happenings, certain synchronicities of certain happenings in such a strange way. He said, how come? I didn't have to read this book today. How did it come into my hands? How did I open this page today? Why did I take this turn? How could I meet this man today? I have no plans. So when these things happen, these coincidences, we know something is going on. And it's, it's the experience of those who are getting ready, who are preparing for the spiritual journey. The more they prepare, the more intense they are, the more the longing and seeking within, the more the number of coincidences of this kind that happen. And therefore, by coincidence, they come across a being who doesn't even claim to be a teacher. He's not coming to prove himself a teacher. He's coming to touch our hearts and say, there's something true within our own self. Why does he say that? Why do his words have that effect upon us? Where is he touching us? He's touching us at an awakened stage, which we realize when we go up that he was always there and not outside. So this, such is the beautiful manner in which these masters do their work. So the message is very clear. The truth is within. When you are ready, the master will appear and show you the way. And if you are ready, follow the way within. Don't change the direction. At any stage, at every level of experience, the direction remains the same. Within, more within, more within, ultimately you find your own self. That is you, your teacher, and your creator. Thank you very much.